Hi, my name is Don Forsythe. These are the slides that go with the annual Harry Kirk Wolf lecture on teaching and psychology, which I'll be delivering at the Southwestern Psychological Association meetings. The topic is teaching and learning with the self in mind, sponsored by the educational directorate of APA. I begin with the basic point that humans have a unique capacity for self-reflection, self-analysis, and that may or may not help us learn and teach more effectively. The idea of the self can be traced back to James's classic distinction between the self as known and knower, the self as content, but also the self as the processor of information, including consciousness, awareness, and volition. What are the implications of this, this binary, dualistic self for teaching and learning? Well, obviously the self has many positive consequences for learning, including self-regulation, self-efficacy, and the visioning of possible future selves. But in this presentation, I focus more on the negative side of the self, the self as a source of bias. For example, individuals don't really study as much as they possibly should in preparation for class, with only 45% putting in two hours or less. One explanation is the self simply doesn't value the identity of a scholar. Also, students may already feel they understand the material illustrating the better-than-average effect, also known as the Lake Wobegon effect, the idea we all feel we are better than average. David Dunning and his colleagues have illustrated the consequences of this effect by asking students to predict their grade as they leave an examination. Even the very low-scoring students feel that they have outperformed everyone else, the average student in the class. Teachers themselves are influenced by the Lake Wobegon effect. For 94% of teachers polled in one study felt that they were better than average. And yet that analysis conflicts with students' ratings of instruction. Nowadays, those ratings are actually more public than professors may wish, sparking a relatively heated debate about the validity of student evaluation of instruction and their overall usefulness. In part, negative feedback causes the self to react very defensively, and so the desire to maintain self-esteem is one of the self's most powerful motives. Self-esteem has increased over the years, as demonstrated by research conducted by Judy Twang. She finds also that self-esteem is quite high around the world, um, to the point where educators often encourage students that nothing is beyond their grasp. In consequence, perhaps, students, when they do receive negative feedback, are shocked by that negative feedback. Heider drew a classic distinction between internal and external causes of success and failure. Or Weiner extended that model to include controllability. In our own research, we've identified that students intuitively distinguish between inhibiting causes of performance and facilitating causes of performance. After success, they stress facilitating causes, most of which are internal, after failure, they stress external causes, most of which are exter or external inhibiting causes. You would think that when students stress external causes of their failures, it supports, maintains the self. But in our research, we do find that externalizing after failure actually causes the self to decline even further. So the self-esteem maintenance bias is not actually maintaining the self. What can we do to cope with the, the negative consequences of the self or performance? You could teach students to make more internable, internal controllable attributions following failure. What not to do? In one study, we directly helped students increase self-esteem following failure. Uh, that study suggested that helping students maintain self-esteem actually had a negative effect on their self-esteem. Thank you very much.